Hello and welcome back. So this is probably one of the harder videos I've made in the past, say, year or so, where we're going to be taking a look at what is called the Paley-Wiener Theorem. So last time we saw that if we take an L2 signal and we take its Laplace transform, that the Laplace transform of that signal is going to be analytic in the right half of the complex plane. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go backwards and we're going to see that if we have an analytic function on the right half of the complex plane that satisfies certain norm inequalities, that we can actually recover an L2 signal. And this L2 signal is going to be supported only on the right half of the real line. So this is going to require a bit of complex analysis, Fourier analysis, and also a touch of real analysis. And so I really hope you guys like the video. It's taken me like two weeks of recording on and off. And if you end up really liking it, please go ahead and boop the like button so that it can get out to more people. The more people like the videos, the more YouTube feels like pushing it. And so with that, why don't we go ahead and get started. So remember, if we have an L2 function and we take its Laplace transform, then we know that the result is an analytic function in the right half of the complex plane. And the idea of the Paley-Wiener theorem is that we can go backwards. If we have a function that is analytic in the right half of the complex plane, and along every single vertical line, the function restricted to that line gives us a signal that is an L2 then it turns out that there is an L2 signal for which this analytic function is its Fourier transform. So in other words, we can take an L2 signal and we can get a Laplace transform out of it, and we can also go backwards. Now, the way that we're gonna go backwards is that we're gonna fashion an inverse for the Laplace transform out of the inverse for the Fourier transform. Now, another requirement that we have on these analytic functions is that along each one of these strips, it is an L2 signal. And moreover, we assume that the norm of these L2 signals is uniformly bounded as you move through all the vertical lines in the right half of the complex plane. Now, how do we do this? Here's the clever idea. Let's assume it's true. And this will give us some sort of heuristic to start with, and it's gonna give us some meat to like get our teeth into. So for instance, we know that along each vertical strip, that is a Fourier transformable function because it's an L2. And now if this happened to come from the Laplace transform of a function in L2, then we should be able to write our analytic function as the integral from zero to infinity of f of t times e to the minus st dt. Now let's fix the real part of s, and we'll call it x at various points. Let's say x is equal to one. Then we'll just look at the Laplace transform when we restrict x to be one and we let y do what it wants. We have this Laplace transform and I'm gonna go ahead and extend it to be negative infinity to infinity and we'll just assume that f of t is zero for all negative values. It's actually something we'll have to end up proving later. So then for x equals one, this Laplace transform becomes the integral from zero to infinity of f of t times e to the minus one plus i y times t integrated dt. And now I would like to turn this into a Fourier transform. And in particular, what ends up happening is that we can rearrange these terms on the inside. And so I end up getting the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of t times e to the t, and this times e to the minus i y t dt. And this is exactly the Fourier transform of f of t times e to the t. And so along the vertical line x equals one, we should have the Fourier transform of f of t times e to the t, assuming that this f signal existed in the first place. That means that if I were to take the inverse Fourier transform, I should get f of t times e to the t. Now there's nothing special about x equals one. It's just gonna be convenient for us to anchor there. But we can move x to be another vertical line. And in that case, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get f of t times e to the x times t. Now we got to this reasoning by assuming that there was some L2 signal out there. So now what we're gonna end up doing is we're going to try to see if we can show that no matter which line we choose, that that f is uniquely defined. So let's go ahead and talk about Cauchy's theorem and how we're gonna use it. So now we have candidates for our signal. And in particular for each vertical line, if we take the inverse Fourier transform along that vertical line of our Laplace transform, then we end up getting our candidate signal times an exponential. We can actually go ahead and take that exponential and move it to the other side. And then we get our candidate that corresponds to that particular vertical line with that particular real part. And this is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x plus i y times e to the x plus i y times t. And this integrated with respect to dy. Now, what we like to show is that this integral is independent of our choice of x. And the way we're gonna show this is we're gonna use Cauchy's theorem. We're gonna take two of those integrals and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a segment of them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, take the real part equaling one and we're gonna look at the segment that goes from one minus i k for some k real number all the way up to 
one plus i k. And then we're gonna do that for another one that corresponds to the real part being equal to x, where x is arbitrary. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take those two line segments and we're gonna connect them horizontally. So we're gonna take the top points of those segments and we're gonna connect them. And we're gonna take the bottom points and connect those as well. And now if we take a look at this rectangle, we see that if we take the integral in a clockwise pattern around this rectangle, the overall integral is gonna be zero. And that's because we already assumed that f was analytic in the right half plane and an exponential function is as well. The next thing that we're going to show is that as we take that k and make it go to infinity, there's going to be some subsequence of k's where the horizontal lines, their contribution to this integral goes to zero. And then if we take a look at Cauchy's formula, we see that this integral can be broken up into several pieces. The two pieces that are contributed from the horizontal pieces, which we're hoping are going to go to zero, or at least along some subsequence. And then we are also going to have that we're integrating the vertical segments in two opposite directions. So if we take one of those segments and flip them around, then we see that they are actually opposing each other. And thus, if we have those two horizontal segments going to zero, well, we know the whole contribution is going to be zero from this integral. And so then that means those two vertical lines have to be identical, at least along the subsequence. Now, the reason why we have to appeal to a subsequence is that we're going to end up showing that these end up going to zero underneath the inter integral. Now, this isn't a series where if you have a convergent series, that you know that the series itself has to go to zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these vertical segments and I'm going to show you it goes to zero. And what we're going to do first is we're going to take that integral along that vertical segment, we're going to take its absolute value and we're going to square it. And then we're going to apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality because what else do you do with integrals? Once we get that, we have a term that involves only the exponential and that's constant with respect to k, so we're not going to have to worry about that. And then that other piece is the integral from one to x of the magnitude of our Laplace transform evaluated at u plus i y, and that squared, and integrated to u. So one thing that we're assuming about our analytic functions in this right half plane is that along every vertical line, the restriction to that line, they're in L2. And moreover, their L2 norms along each of these lines is uniformly bounded. So for instance, if I were to take the integral from one to x of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of our analytic function at x plus i y, that magnitude squared, and then this integral dy, and then the outside integral du, that this has to be bounded by that uniform bound, let's call it c, times x minus one. And then if we exchange the order of integration, we see that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the integrals along our vertical line segments is actually bounded, which means that it's integrable, which means that there is some subsequence where it must be going to zero. And so then that gets us the zero that we want. And so this tells us that the integrals on these two vertical line segments are converging to each other as the line segments get very large according to the subsequence. So now the next thing we need to show is that as these vertical line segments go off to infinity, that they're actually converging to what we think they're converging to. And more than that, we need to show that this candidate signal has to be zero for all negative t. And then that would wrap up the Paley-Wiener theorem. Okay. So now let's see where we are. So now if we take a look at the partial integrals for the Fourier transform, the ones that correspond to the sequence that we just looked at. So we have basically just shown that if you multiply it by this exponential term, that the difference between the one that you started with corresponding to the real part being x and another one where you had the real part being one, that difference ends up going to zero as j goes to infinity. But we also need that as j goes to infinity that we're gonna end up having agreement with the actual Fourier transform. And this ends up happening through the Plantrell theorem. And through a theorem and real analysis, we know that there's a subsequence that converges almost everywhere. And now we have just established a chain of equalities. So if we start with our signal f of t, we know that almost everywhere, this whole chain ends up working out. And we see here that the selection of our vertical line does not actually matter. And it gives us the same signal almost everywhere, which is the best you can really hope for, for an L2 signal. Now let's see that the other properties or signal that we wanted actually still hold. And the properties here are that one, we want the norm to still be bounded by the same constant that the analytic function was over each one of these vertical strips. And we would also like that it is zero for all negative t. So in order to do that, we're gonna exploit Plantrell's theorem again. And so now if we take a look at the integral from negative infinity to infinity of the magnitude of our signal times e to the minus xt, 
and that quantity squared. We can use the isometry that you get for the Fourier transform between L2 functions, which means it doesn't change the norm between the original function and the Fourier transform in L2. And so we can now appeal to the L2 norm along the vertical line corresponding to the real part being x of our analytic function. And this has to agree with that previous one. But then we know that this integral itself is bounded by some constant, and that's just from the hypothesis. And then we see that if we let x tend to zero, we're going to be approaching the L2 norm of our signal. And moreover, the sequence taking x to zero is gonna end up being uniformly bounded. So that gives us a bound on the L2 norm of our signal. And now let's take a look at the last property. We want it to be zero for all negative t. And that follows exactly from this chain of equalities here. So now let's assume the contrary. Let's assume that our signal is non-zero on a set of non-zero measure on the negative half of the real line. If this were the case, then that exponential ends up having a positive term for all the t's in this range. And all positive x. And then as x goes and blows up to infinity, well, we see that that whole chunk of the integral is also going to be blowing up to infinity. And this contradicts the uniform bound that we established above. So that means we have a contradiction. So f has to be zero almost everywhere on the negative half of the real line. And well, that's exactly what we wanted. And I appreciate you sticking it through for these two videos that led up to here. So this whole sequence of videos I have on the Laplace transform are aimed at giving a solid mathematical background for control theory. And this Paley-Wiener theorem itself is will support our claims about H-infinity control. And if you like this video, please go ahead and boop the like button so that YouTube will want to share this with more and more people and more people can get the message. Thank you for watching and sticking in here with me, and I hope you have a great day.